Who generates the nonce? If my pool is the one to generate the random number, how is it protected from us to know it? What makes the net random number itself tamper-proof? Is the whole network contributing to the random number? All right. So the nonce, the random number, is calculated independently billions and billions and billions of times per second by each mining hardware system. So when a miner is mining, what they're doing essentially is coordinating over a network a very large number of mining computers, and these mining computers are calculating billions of nonces per second. And there's nothing manual about this, by the way. This, when we say a miner is mining, a, a, a nonce is being calculated, there's no one sitting there doing a calculation or validating transactions or clicking approve. Uh, these are completely automated, unattended operations that happen where computers calculate um, billions of nonces per second. So, what is the purpose of the nonce? The nonce is simply a random number, and it's a very large random number. Uh, the space for a nonce is 32 bits, which gives 4 billion possible combinations. But there's also some extra space in the block, uh, which is called extra nonce. And extra nonce really allows you to expand that uh, to much more than 32 bits. So you can try uh, many, 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 many billions upon billions of combinations. You're going to hear me say billions and billions again and again in this talk, because uh, these numbers are truly very, very large. So the purpose of the nonce is to plug it in to the block header, in uh, the specific location in the block header that is for the nonce, and then calculate a new block header hash. And when you put the header information plus the nonce um, into the hashing algorithm, you'll get a hash. Uh, a number will pop out. It's a 256-bit number. Now that number has to start with a lot of zeros. If it doesn't, you try again with another nonce. So the only part of the header you can change is the nonce. So when the miner is mining, what they're doing is they're constructing a block. They're putting all of the transactions and the other information into the header, the timestamp, etc., etc. And then once they've got that header, they plug in a nonce, any nonce, let's say the number one. And then they calculate the header hash. And they look to see if it matches this special pattern, which is that it starts with a lot of zeros. And the chances of it starting with a zero. Um, it, well, they get lower the more zeros you expect to find at the beginning of the number. Um, but uh, in, the, in the beginning, let's say you're looking just for one bit to be zero, then about half the hashes you produce will have a zero bit in the beginning, and half the hashes will have a one. Um, if you want two zeros in the beginning, that it's a one in four chance. If you want three zeros in the beginning, then it's a one in eight chance. If you want four zero bits in the beginning, then it's a one in sixteen chance. And by the time you get to uh, the numbers we see with uh, blocks today, we're looking at about one in five. A septillion chance of you having that many zeros at the beginning of the block. And how do you find the one in several septillion chances? Well, you try a septillion times per second. Uh, and you do that by trying as many possible different nonces with the header you've constructed. One of the miners is going to be lucky. In one of those attempts, they will find uh, a nonce that, when fitted into the block that they've constructed as a candidate, will produce a header that has this many bits of zeros in the beginning that matches the pattern, matches the difficulty required by the network. And that is a winning block. That is a valid block. And as soon as they've found that, they can then announce this random number. So the random number isn't tamper-proof. It's not secret. Uh, and the mining pool doesn't pick this random number. Every mining machine out there is trying billions of these random numbers every second. Uh, and they discard all of the results until they find one random number that produces a hash that has this particular property. It starts with a lot of zeros.
Osita asks, is it possible to develop an algorithm for guessing a nonce, which will fast-track solving the Bitcoin challenge by a miner? Could that be related to the recent shattering of SHA-1? Uh, yes, that is an excellent question, Osita. Um, in fact, uh, yes, there is the possibility of creating a shortcut that allows you to predict the, the value that is required in a nonce in order to produce proof of work of a specific target. Uh, that would involve breaking, uh, shattering, if you like, SHA-256. SHA-1 was recently shattered, as the popular expression goes, meaning that uh, the SHA-1 cryptographic algorithm, cryptographic hashing algorithm, sorry, uh, has been compromised in such a way that you can uh, you can create a collision. That means that you can produce um, a specific pre-image to the cryptographic hash algorithm, which will result in a desired uh, hash as its output. Uh, that ability to produce a desired hash from a pre-image uh, that is identical, perhaps, to another, um, to the fingerprint of another pre-image, a collision, as it's called. Uh, is a fatal flaw. And if you discover a fatal flaw in an algorithm, as has been discovered in SHA-1, uh, then that algorithm is no, no longer suitable as a cryptographic hash algorithm. You cannot use it for the purpose of fingerprinting documents. You cannot use it for the purpose of, uh, for example, fingerprinting uh, digital keys, uh, certificates, SSL, uh, cryptographic keys and uh, the integrity of messages that are validated through uh, cryptographic hash algorithms. And SHA-1 can no longer be used for those purposes, because it has been fatally compromised. Um, however, uh, Bitcoin mining uses SHA-256. SHA-256 is enormously more complicated to compromise. So um, every cryptographic algorithm has a certain shelf life. Uh, on average, 20 to 25 years before a cryptographic algorithm can no longer be considered secure. Depending on the cryptographic algorithm, the shelf life, if you like, for that algorithm may be greater or lesser. Some have uh, weaknesses that are discovered, which shorten the shelf life, uh, make it easier to find a shortcut to compromise. Most cryptographic algorithms are based on some kind of trapdoor function, a mathematical function, that has no shortcut, where um, the amount of computation required to go one way through the algorithm versus to go the opposite way uh, is immense. And as long as you can find a shortcut, that algorithm is secure uh, to a certain amount of computation. If there is no shortcut, uh, SHA-256 will continue to be secure uh, for decades and decades longer. If a compromise is found, or some kind of shortcut, that doesn't mean it's fatal. Uh, it doesn't necessarily immediately invalidate the algorithm. It may weaken it by a certain percentage, so it may make it twice as hard, uh, sorry, twice as easy to find uh, a suitable hash, um, or maybe four times as easy to find a suitable hash. And that would certainly, uh, by weakening the algorithm, shorten its shelf life. Because as computing power continues to develop. Uh, that means that at some point it would be viable uh, to break the algorithm, essentially. Um, now, so far, there is no shortcut that has been discovered for SHA-256. Um, one of the reasons we know that is because Bitcoin represents effectively a giant global piñata stuffed with $15 billion, that if you bash with the right shortcut for SHA-256, you can break it open and collect $15 billion. Or uh, you can collect some percentage of that before the value collapses catastrophically uh, by breaking the piñata. Um, essentially, it is a honeypot. Uh, Bitcoin represents a global test that tells us that SHA-256 is secure. How do you know SHA-256 is secure? Bitcoin is worth $15 billion and no one's cracked it yet. Um, now, at some point, it may become obvious that SHA-256 is no longer secure, or it's reaching uh, the end of its life, or uh, we find uh, new vectors that perhaps in a decade or a longer period of time may make it insecure. At that point, um, the Bitcoin developers, in collaboration with the rest of the community, would have to work to modify the proof-of-work algorithm and replace it with a more modern uh, algorithm. 
Uh, and certainly that would be a very big undertaking. Uh, so that's how we know that, that there is no shortcut to SHA-256. And if Bitcoin was using SHA-1, um, then uh, some miner out there today uh, would have been able to break it. And very quickly, every miner out there would have been able to break it, at which point it's no longer useful as a mining algorithm. Is Bitcoin an incentive for the development of the quantum computer? I mean, being a possible threat to the network security, doesn't this accelerate the race towards it? Do you think miners think about this at all? Great question. Um, Bitcoin is a honeypot. Effectively, it provides a bounty for anyone who produces any type of technology, whether it's a SHA-256 collision that we were talking about before, uh, whether it's a quantum computing shortcut to SHA, or to elliptic curve uh, digital signature algorithms um, that may result in, in uh, being able to compromise some or part of Bitcoin or being able to weaken Bitcoin. Uh, certainly, that provides an incentive. So you can think of Bitcoin as a test. Uh, Bitcoin tells us SHA-256 is secure, ECDSA is secure today um, from all, any and all threats. And how do we know that? It's because it continues to maintain security over $15 billion. Therefore, we can assume that these technologies have not been compromised yet. Um, does it accelerate the development of these things? Probably, although I think uh, most of the really interesting developments in quantum computing uh, can deliver a far, far greater reward for those who uh, develop these technologies than simply the $15 billion that's tied up in, in Bitcoin, because quantum computing has very broad applications. Furthermore, um, the application of quantum computing to Bitcoin is marginal at best. First of all, uh, SHA-256 and cryptographic hash algorithms like SHA are not particularly easy to optimize using quantum algorithms. Uh, elliptic curve digital signature algorithm and elliptic curve cryptography can be massively optimized with quantum computing, and quantum algorithms for doing elliptic curve uh, factoring, in fact, do exist, and they uh, will allow someone to break elliptic curve uh, cryptography eventually, and factor large elliptic uh, uh, prime fields, elliptic curve fields. Uh, for now, the elliptic curves that we use are far greater uh, in the field that's used for the elliptic curve is far greater than any quantum computer can uh, factor. So that's not a risk. At some point, it would become a risk. Um, and at that point, you have very, very powerful quantum computers that can do that. Uh, and then the security of elliptic curve cryptography is no longer good. Um, but elliptic curve cryptography can be replaced in Bitcoin by other algorithms. And because of the mechanism by which um, public keys are not demonstrated to the network until an amount is spent, if you follow the best practice of only using uh, an address once uh, for each transaction, then the only time your public key is demonstrated to the network, shown to the network, is um, when you've spent the amount of Bitcoin that was in that address. Um, and therefore, even if you were able to break public keys, um, as used in elliptic curve cryptography, you wouldn't have any Bitcoin to get behind it, because it was only ever used once. Uh, Bitcoin addresses, of course, are secured through two applications of hashing algorithms, SHA-256 and RIPE uh, MD-160. And those are far less susceptible. Those two algorithms, as well as the mining algorithm on SHA-256 as well, are far less susceptible to quantum algorithm optimizations, as far as we know. Um, and therefore, it may be a very long time until quantum cryptography has any impact on Bitcoin. And of course, the other thing to consider is it also depends on how broadly quantum cryptography is available. If uh, sorry, quantum computing is available. If quantum computing is broadly available. Uh, then just as much as you can make better algorithms for cracking keys, you can also make better algorithms for making keys. Um, you can make quantum mining algorithms. You can make quantum cryptography algorithms. So if quantum cryptography, sorry, quantum computing is broadly available, um, then I can use quantum computing to do encryption and digital signatures and mining. And then the fact that others have quantum computing doesn't make any difference because my cryptography, my digital signatures, and my mining uh, algorithm are just as secure. Uh, so really, it's about the unequal availability 
of quantum cryptography, which is a whole other topic, perhaps for another session.